Uh, our next speaker, it's not from the UN, but from Canada. <laughs> Those of you who were yesterday, you had the abil uh, ability to listen to him for the whole day. It's Dr. Gordon Neufeld, a Canadian developmental psychologist with over 40 years of experience with children, youth, and their parents. Uh, Dr. Neufeld is an international speaker, as you know, as you see here, since he's in Sweden now, he was recently in Moscow, he's going to Berlin, he's going to Denmark as well, and Zurich as well, yeah. So he's traveling all over the world. Um, a best-selling author with his book, um, um, what is it called in this English now again? Hold on to your kids. Why parents matters more than peers. But you've written, it's translated into 15 different languages. Uh, the New Food Institute, as well, is a worldwide charitable organization and training others, uh, others as well. You're the father of five, and you have five giant grandchildren, or is almost it six. almost six grandchildren? <laughs> so, and your topic is why children need family to flowers. We're looking forward to listen to you. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here, and a big uh, thanks to, uh, to Haro for arranging this event in celebration of the family uh, and as the uh, 20th anniversary of the Year of the Family, uh, first declared by United Nations. And so this is a, a special time, I, uh, um, and uh, I, uh, it... it I'm pleased and honored uh, to be part of this celebration. Now, I, I didn't start out uh, with the intention uh, to uncover the role of the family in uh, the raising of children and the realization of human potential. My agenda as a developmental scientist has always been very clear, very singular, and that is to make sense of children. It's in the making sense of children that uh, I came to the inescapable conclusion uh, of the pivotal role that family has and why it is the most natural uh, and the most suitable context for raising children. How it is the best institution we've ever had and how we need to be able to support this. Now, as you see, there, uh, uh, that, uh, there isn't a doubt that family is important. The issue is why is it important? How, how does it serve that function? And that's what I'm going to try and explain. Uh, it's uh, going to try to give an understanding of, uh, of its role in the unfolding of human potential uh, because I, I don't think we can probably address a problem we don't quite understand. So it's one thing to make a declaration, it's another thing to have an insight. And I think if we have insight, that is what will give, uh, give some power, give some, uh, give some support uh, to uh, provide the kind of... of um, <coughs> of uh, help, assistance, uh, that the families are in need of today. Uh, so I chose the title, Why Children Need Family to Flourish, the pivotal role of family in providing the conditions uh, conducive to the realization of human potential. Uh, the point will be that families don't always work, and I won't belabor that point. That point is made so much it doesn't require me to say so. So I'll say it here, families don't always work. The point will be that family is the natural, the intended, and the best suited uh, for the raising of children to their full potential. And so that will be what I will try to make sense of. We'll move first of all to the definition of flourish. Uh, it's a beautiful word. 
absolutely beautiful word. Uh, to flourish, uh, a verb, of course, the noun, is uh, not what we want to pay attention to. Uh, that means something rather uh, frivolous uh, and exotic and extravagant and uh, somewhat useless. And so uh, a flourish is something that's added to something as a noun, right? It's added to the most important part. It's kind of confusing. When we use it as a verb, it has a totally different meaning. To grow well or luxuriantly, to thrive, to grow and develop in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as a result of favorable conditions. Uh, I'm a gardener, and I love to take walks in the spring and the summer, uh, view other people's gardens, and uh, sometimes I see a same plant that I have in my garden, but that plant is flourishing. <laughs> And then I'm very curious, uh, see if the gardener is there, if I can find out the secrets. What is the soil condition? What is the pH condition? What, how do you fertilize this? You know, what is the key here to the, uh, uh, to the flourishing of this plant? Uh, because we all, as gardeners, want our plants to realize their potential. And so how, how is that to be, uh, to be experienced? Uh, this, is, this is the most important question in society. What are the conditions that are conducive uh, to the flourishing of children? Because if we have flourishing children, we will have a flourishing culture and a society. There could be no other important question than that. If we get those conditions right, and I'm convinced that developmental science is delivering us the information that we need. Uh, in putting the pieces together, uh, they, uh, they are coming clear and clear as to what is required. But first of all, I want to take uh, a look at, at what, uh, if, if, if you were taking a walk uh, down the garden, so to speak, of civilization, of society, the streets, what would a flourishing child look like? You know, what would it look like for a human being uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, approach a full potential? What does it mean, uh, this full potential? So I first of all want to, uh, want to define that a bit, and I'll define three aspects to this, three aspects to this, uh, to full potential. As humans... We have the potential to be viable, separate beings, able to stand on our feet, think for ourselves, have our own values, our own nucleus of personality, uh, be able to uh, be filled with intentions, um, to be able to steer in the direction of those intentions, and to be able to function apart from attachments. This is a potential. No child is born this way. This is a human potential. That potential is in every single human, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter whether they have been born in you know, 3000 AD or 3000 BC. It doesn't matter what, to what diagnosis they come with. That human potential is in every single child to move towards becoming viable as a separate being. Most people think that you have to teach this. In fact, the message you just heard assumed that that was so. And I think that is the, the flaw when we think of family as a learning institution. As soon as you think of it, it sows the seeds of its demise. The message may have been very good, what you heard, but in a sense, it had a fatal flaw. It was not developmental. It did not understand the unfolding of human potential. And this is what I, I, I want to ex express here. Uh, so this, uh, uh, go back to viability as a human potential. Uh, where does it come from? That's a question. What are the conditions that are conducive for this to unfold? Uh, what is the garden, the human garden that this unfolds in? Secondly, Every single human being has the potential to be changed by that which they cannot change. When up against circumstances and situations that are out of control, 
humans have, have the potential uh, to be able to change, to be transformed, to adapt to those circumstances, to be resilient, to be resourceful. But like viability, this happens, it is spontaneous, but it is not inevitable. We know lots of 40 and 50 year olds, 60 year olds that are not adaptive, that are not viable as separate beings. And so the question is, what are the conditions? When, how does this happen? What is it? Um, it doesn't matter how many degrees education one has, so we know school isn't the answer. Uh, medication, there's not one single pill, not one single pill that humans have invented uh, that will move towards the unfolding of human potential. So we know medication is not the answer. So what is the answer? What is the answer? Thirdly, a social being, and by social being here, I don't mean just to get along. Not just to get along, be nice, uh, to be uh, this more to this. It is how to be able uh, to do togetherness, uh, to seek contact and closeness, love and affection, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to want to be together, and to be your own person at the same time. Not to compromise yourself, your own thoughts, your values, and so on. So how to do get togetherness and separateness simultaneously. That means to be civilized, responsible, considerate, respectful, egalitarian. These are, this is, is phenomenal. We all have that potential, but how is it to be realized? Uh, what is the key uh, to be this kind of social being? Those of you who are married, who are listening to this presentation, uh, will know that this is a huge challenge in marriage. How do you, uh, marriage is all about togetherness, uh, to belong, to be one, to, uh, to be significant, to matter, to love, uh, to hold dear. And yet, how do you be your own person? How do you seek togetherness without sacrificing separateness? How do you have separateness without sacrificing togetherness? This is the ultimate question, of course, in civilization, in community, in society. And we all have that potential. Where does it come from? And it turns out that when all the pieces are put together, there are three maturing processes, three processes which are responsible to help us grow out, uh, grow up. They're part of the limbic system, the emotional brain, uh, that uh, we understand they're the engine of maturation. And these three processes we call, we, there are many names in developmental science, but I'll uh, refer to them as the adaptive process, uh, to emerge as a viable separate being, and to integrate conflicting elements or signals. Uh, these three processes uh, are at work at every level, at the cellular level, at the system level, at the organ level, at the brain level, uh, in the, uh, the sensory systems, and finally at the emotional level and at the personality level. And these three processes give rise to an array of fruit uh, that we could define this is what it means to be flourishing. This is our human potential, to be viable as a separate being, full of vitality, not easily bored, have a sense of agency and responsibility, to be full of interest and curiosity, a venturing forth energy, to have a relationship with oneself, and a strong quest for doing it oneself for independence. Uh, this is a desire for independence. Parents would come to me and say, well, how do I get my child to dress herself? And I would say, well, th we're not concerned about that as developmental scientists. And they would say, well, what do you mean you're not concerned about it? Uh, isn't all of life, aren't I supposed to train independence? And i say, no, 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 uh, that will happen naturally. Tell me, does your child want to dress herself? Mother or father would look. I said, well, that's what I asked you. How do I get my child to dress herself? I said, no, listen to me. I asked, does your child want to dress herself? That's the issue. Your child could be a quadriplegic, never be able to dress herself in her life, but does she want to? That you cannot teach a child. That you can't get from going to school. That you can't. That is something that is at the basic core level of the unfolding of human potential. If you have a child who wants 
to be her own person, wants to think for herself, then she will ultimately get there. But the issue is in, in, in the wanting. This is the fruit of the emergent process. This is spontaneous. You can't make it happen. You can't train this. It happens. It's spontaneous, but it's not inevitable. Same with the adaptive fruit. This is huge. This is the key to being resilient, resourceful, to benefiting from adversity, to learning from consequences, uh, to benefiting from correction. We thought that all children could learn from their mistakes. It turns out, and it's quite obvious, that many of us adults still do not learn from mistakes. It is a potential, not an inevitability. So the question is, what is the key? What is the secret? The integrative process, this leads uh, to those sets of attributes that you hear in Sweden and some other, other countries represented, Italy and so on, uh, here today as, as well as in Canada. We put on the highest uh, list. Well-tempered, considered and civilized, balanced, appreciates context, sees perspective, egalitarian values, and of course the key of this which will go to learns from dissonance. These are the fruit of maturation, like apples, pears, the fruit, the flowers. This is a fruit of a flourishing. Uh, of, this, is a, this is a fruit of flourishing. The question is, is where does it come from? Uh, this is, um, this, th if, you, if your child, you were sending your child to university, and they were needing uh, to get references, and the references came with these attributes, there would be a sense of fulfillment as a parent. You know? <laughs> this, this, there would be a huge sense of fulfillment. These attributes, you will look, none of them are genetic. They're not genetic. You cannot teach anybody to be like this. So where are they from? Where are they from? And the, this is the unfolding. I'll go into this and the role of family in this. But first of all, just a few uh, words about uh, defining the family uh, from the perspective of, a, of a, an attachment-based developmental perspective. There is much, uh, much uh, being much concern about how families are defined, uh, many groups around trying to figure out how to define a family. And I'm going to define it, uh, uh, looking at it a slightly different, not from the adult perspective, not from societal perspective, but from the child's perspective. Uh, first of all, it is a matter of attachment, not genetics. Who is the true parent of a child is who the child attaches to most strongly in the parent role. It could be a stepmother, not a genetic mother. It could be a foster parent. It could be a teacher. It, 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 it is a matter of attachment, not, not genetics. Nor is it a matter of law. It is a matter of attachment. Secondly, unlike all other social roles, if you're a sociologist or you understand sociology, when you look, first of all, at the importance of society and their roles, uh, the first thing you will be taught that family roles are distinctly different to every other role in society. And that distinct difference is that family roles are permanent. Every other role is transitory and so on. Family roles are meant to transcend even death. The ultimate challenge of this. And so, uh, for instance, when a, uh, a, 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 a three-year-old gets very, very concerned, a four-year-old realizes that bad things can happen and says to mommy, Mommy, may something bad happen to, to you? Uh, may you get sick? May you die? Uh, the mother appeals. The, uh, an intuitive mother will not say to the child, Hmm, I see you figured out uh, uh, things rather, uh, rather quickly. You're precocious. Uh, this is called existential anxiety. And yes, I, I could die. And good luck with this. Uh, no. No, none of us, none of us in our right minds would ever think of, of pushing the child's face into that separation. Because that is what family is for. We dig way down deep 
And if you're intuitive at all, the answer will come instantaneously. We say to the child, don't you worry. I will always be your mother. Now, that's true, dead or alive. But we don't get into that part. Why? Because we're trying to give the sense of permanence. That's everything. That's everything. When we're going to look at this, the family role, where it comes from, when you look at it from attachment, is the key. It's the key to creating the context that is required for children to be raised. If the mother said, no, I am I'm planning to, uh, uh, to, to leave next week, or I may not, it would be over. There would be no ability to raise that child. And that is the key. Everybody looks at it from an adult point of view. And they look at it in terms of the family as a, a learning institution competing with school and other things. It is not. You, you have to start from the place of attachment and have to start from the place that the role is permanent. And so family-like, we, we go through this process when we marry each other to make each other family. And we give it the best hope we can to give our hearts to each other so that we can be vulnerable enough to attach to each other. We say, I will take care of you. I will be with you until life do us part. Now, we don't go as far as saying it will transcend death, but we go as far as we can, and unless we can say this to each other, we don't feel free to attach to each other, and then the context isn't there to take care of each other. That is That simple secret of family is everything. When you look at that, you get to understand what it is about. So what is a family? A child's family consists of his or her attachments to those in a family role. Parent, grandparent, sibling, cousin, uncle, aunt, and any derivation of such, half, stepmother, uh, godfather, uh, foster, in-law, adopted, surrogate, any derivation of such. Okay? And so it is a family, a child creates the family through attachment. That is how it's created. It is a function of attachment, not a function of law. Once we have this, we have the beginning understanding. If we don't define the uh, uh, family properly, we, don't, we are not able to discern its function. We're not able to discern its pivotal role. And that's the huge mistake. The huge mistake is, is to take a social definition of family rather than an attachment definition of family and then try to proceed with it. And we run into all kinds of problems. And so this is, this is a psychological definition of family. And now we'll proceed. And first of all, I go to the United Nations Declaration on the Family. It came out in June, I believe, if I am right, after a, a declaration to the General Assembly that was, uh, that was accepted, uh, a, a declaration by the Human Rights Council uh, on June 25, 2014, uh, made in the United Nations Assembly. Family is a fundamental group of society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members, and particularly children. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Family should be afforded the necess necessary protection and assistance so it can fully assume its responsibilities in the community. Absolutely flows logically from this. That family works is inarguable. Research is unequivocal that those with deep emotional connections are less lonely, live longer, heal better, are less troubled, are more healthy, and are happier. And family is where those deep emotional connections are most, most likely to be. Research is also clear that children who spend more time in the context of family are better off developmentally, emotionally, in every which way. This research is unarguable. Why family works is rarely explained. And in this age, we need to understand why in order to properly defend and safeguard, again, the best human institution the world has ever known. I believe we have to understand why. And so what I'm going to try and do is break it down. 
What do children need to flourish? What are the, uh, the pivotal experiences? What are the critical experiences? And what is the role that family has in this? So I will try to explain this. Again, going from the developmental science. In developmental science, if the, if the pieces are put together, what are the three, what are the four conditions uh, that must be there uh, for flourishing to result? If we can answer these, then we can look at, well, what is the role of family in this? And so that's my approach uh, to do justice to it. I would love to have uh, uh, a day of your time, uh, two days, a week of your time, uh, to do justice to it. I, I, I would love to do a whole uh, a graduate course on university on this. And certainly there would be enough, in fact, there would be more than enough information, research and studies uh, to be able to give you this. It, it, we, we could go on and on and on. My challenge will be to do this. In, uh, in the time allotted, which I will uh, do this in the time allotted, uh, and so in the next uh, uh, 75 minutes, uh, we'll, we'll do this, but I will be giving you, in a sense, the summary uh, version of this, of how this works. And so we start... What needs to happen for children to flourish? This, this is the holy grail of parenting. What needs to happen for children to flourish? Now, surprisingly, surprisingly, you would think that maybe they would need to go to right schools. You would think that maybe they have to have the right learning experiences. You might think that it may be a, a key of a parenting approach. Uh, you might think that, uh, uh, you know, that there might, might, must be enough economic means in the family. It turns out that none of these factors even figure into the equation. The first and foremost is so simple that we miss it. Children need to engage in true play. All mammals play. All offspring play. This is absolutely required, but it is an endangered activity in our society today. Well, you might say, oh no, my child is playing video games, you know, uh, several hours a day. Uh, my child is playing sports. My child is playing musical instruments. And my child is engaged in playoffs. My child is doing all of this. We call so many things today play that aren't play at all. We need to understand the essence of play. The essence of play, when we look at it from a psychological point of view, uh, from developmental science, uh, in fact, play has been studied uh, uh, from, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the study of play actually studied with the, uh, started with the ancient Greeks. Uh, but the scientific study of play was serious in the 20th century and has come back to the fore as one of the most important conditions required. Uh, true play... Its primary characteristics, one, it is not work. <laughs> Play is not work. Uh, well, what do we mean? Well, the essence of work is that it's outcome-based. You work towards a goal. The work often is, is, uh, uh, can be aversive, uh, can be uncomfortable, uh, it, but the goal is attractive. And so you work towards a goal. Play is not like this. In play, the outcome is not even considered because the fun, the engagement is in the activity, not in the outcome. It is fundamentally different. In play, in play, the, the engagement is in the activity. I used to play marbles when I went to school. And uh, we had two kinds of, of playing marbles. Uh, we had playing that was, we call playing marbles, that was outcome based. And uh, it, we called it uh, uh, playing keepsies, playing for keeps, right? And when you played those marbles, uh, you know, the, there was winners and losers. And I loved my marbles, my cat size, my steelies, my, oh, I love my marbles. And so there was always the thing when I got to school in the morning, do I play keepsies or funsies? Eh? Funsies meant you got all your marbles back. 
You could simply enjoy the game. And that was the idea. You enjoyed the activity. If you're playing piano and you enjoy the activity rather than practicing for an outcome, a concert. And so you can have the same activity. It can be play or work. Lots of times when I play with this material, I, I mean, I'm playing. And then suddenly I know I have to produce because I have a presentation to make. And then it is work. And so the issue is play is not work. Play is not for real. It's a parenthesis. It's a pretend. There's a parenthesis. It's not in reality. And that is very clear. If it is not clear, there's a problem. It's just like it has is as clear as when you dream and when you don't. What is reality and what isn't? You can have two sisters who are sisters for real, but they have great fun playing at being sisters. And when they're playing at being sisters, they might get into fights, they may get into mock fights and this and that. And the parent comes and say, come on, you girls, get along, don't be mean. And they say, you know, we are just playing. It doesn't count. It's not for real. We are playing. And it is expressive and exploratory. It comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. By this definition, very few video games count as play. Very, very little screen time counts as play. By this definition, this is, this is true play. Its characteristics have to do with fun, safety. Uh, there's freedom. The dictionary definition of this is to move or operate freely in a bounded space. If you think of the mechanic and he says, is there play in this mechanism? It means does it move freely in a bounded space? We'll look later what that bounded space is. I'm going to suggest to you strongly it is family. Uh, that play in a bounded space, uh, a spontaneous activity that cannot be uh, commanded, nor can you teach. You can't teach a child to play. You can teach a child how to play something, but you cannot teach a child to play. Uh, this, is, this is not. You can't command it. You can't say at recess, uh, now go play. Uh, that doesn't mean play happens. In fact, there's good evidence uh, that, uh, that play is, is uh, that children in recess are not playing. It is all about work. It is all about outcome-based, but the outcome is in relationships instead of academics. It's all about who likes who, who rejects who. The cortisol levels go up at recess, not down. This is not an activity that supports growth. This is an activity that gives teachers a break. This is not, not necessarily what children require at all. This is not the kind of play. And so this is the play that it is important. Now we know you can get a PhD these days in play. It is so important. And, uh, and so in play is a growing edge of development. It's where emotion is expressed without repercussion. It is a growing edge. This is where everything unfolds. And this is where human potential unfolds. It actually unfolds in the construct of play, where the brain's problem-solving networks are programmed. When the computer first came out, we made a mistake. We thought the brain was an information processing system like a computer. And then we thought, oh, we've got the secret now. We've got the model of the brain. And we turned out to be completely wrong. It, it, uh, the, the brain, it is not. The end, we thought, and we thought for a long time, uh, that we contribute to brain growth through instruction, uh, instructing a child. So we teach the brain, the organ, to work by instructing. It turns out that instruction has relatively little to do with it. These are just the facts and figures that are basically accumulated, but the brain is a problem-solving network. And it turns out that the networks are created when there's no consequence, when there's no repercussions in play. That's where they're created. So the brains are built in play that become used by school. But brains aren't built in school. They're built in play. We can see this in every mammal. Where life skills are practiced and honed, where the creative edge is more likely to occur, where life can be practiced in a space free of consequences, because that's where we come out in play. And I have, a, I have created a course on play, and, and I, there's so much that can be said this, but this is a hidden activity, because as adults, we think the answer to everything is work. More work. More work. Harder work. Working harder. Oh, 
That's the answer to everything. And it turns out that nature has, has, it's totally paradoxical. It is play. It is play. It is, and the play motif governs the child for the first six years of life. And it needs to be supported if potential is to be realized. Until a child, we now know, uh, has mixed feelings, can say part of me feels this way and part of me feels that way. They don't understand the essence of work. If you say to a four-year-old, if you don't brush your teeth, uh, they will fall out. They'll get rotten. The child bursts into tears because the the, the child thinks that you've told them uh, that their teeth will rot. You said, no, if you do this, but you are talking about outcome-based things. If a child does not yet have mixed feelings, they, don't, they are not able to sacrifice to a goal, which is our psychological definition of maturity or flourishing in this way. And so there's no ability to do this. These are fairly easy things to get a hold of when you understand and to assess. But we have neglected the play motif, and it is an endangered activity. Screens are taking the time that play would take in this. And so this is difficult. Uh, and this is play. The light is getting on the screen here, but when it's uh, dubbed in for the viewers on the Internet, they'll be able to see this, is that the bubble, the bubble here, uh, is, is, is this bubble of play, uh, this is expression without repercussion, is where the growing edges first take place. So the growing edges, the buds, the tentative growth is in the greenhouse or cocoon of play. This is where the repercussions. So we lose play in our society. We lose maturation. Play becomes essential. That brings family into it. Family is best suited to support true play. Only family can adequately serve as a buffer to societal expectations and agendas, providing the freedom to be instead of the pressure to do. Families, first and foremost, should be about being. Being together. Not outcome-based. It is about togetherness. It is about in that context. It's not what families do. Again, you may hear things as you did or that families do this, families do that, families do this. It's not what families do. It's what families are that count. It's not what families do. It's families are in the freedom to be. And only family can protect a child from competing activities that would take away the space for true play. Instruction has become a competing activity because the this, this society always thinks that instruction is the answer, work is the answer, because they think as an adult. Uh, schooling is the answer. Structured activities are the answer. And so family is our hope. Family is, is in a sense, uh, that bounded space. Uh, family attachments Uh, provide that context, it turns out only when a child uh, experiences the attachment needs taken care of, and we'll expand on that, the attachment needs the contact and closeness, the bonds, uh, uh, their satiation there, does the energy move towards play. And it becomes, as a developmental psychologist, uh, I would ask parents already uh, in their child in their second year of life, how long does it take for your child to, e- to engage in emergent play, play for play's sake, uh, play for no other reason uh, than the emergent of energy to this? Because this is, the, this is an indication of flourishing, an indication uh, that the family is being able to provide the conditions conducive uh, to to the flourishing uh, uh, child. And so the answer uh, here is family attachments. But I'll go on. So we could ask the question. Uh, so we've got play. Play is at the top of the, of, of the pyramid, so to speak. Uh, play is what is required uh, for children to flourish. But what comes before play? Surely that's work. I mean, we build this into our society. You must work before you play. You must produce before you play, right? And so surely that's work. Uh, so something, something uh, is, well, it is true 
that something has to work. But the answer is not work as we think it. The answer, interestingly enough, and again, paradoxically enough, is rest. Is rest. That is becoming so clear to us that all growth emanates from a place of rest. Children even have their physical growth at night when they're sleeping. The brain goes into a process of being able to, to, uh, to heal, to, uh, uh, to go into long-term memory, to process the events of the day. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system goes in, or the, parasymp- the autonomic nervous system goes into the rest mode, which is called the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, rather than the work mode, which is called the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, the neurotransmitters change. Uh, the endocrines change. Uh, all from rest. Rest is is the key. All true growth emanates from rest. Again, as adults, we think we have to work at things. It doesn't matter how much we work, we can't make ourselves grow up. No matter how much we work at it, we can't by will. command. Of course, we try uh, to, uh, uh, to command growth in other people. We say to our spouses, our children, come on, grow up. Uh, but it never works. It never works. Uh, all true growth emanates from a place of rest. It includes physical growth, brain growth, emotional growth, as well as psychological maturation. Rest is facilitated, as I said, via the parasympathetic nervous system as opposed to the sympathetic. Restlessness, then, is indicative of the inability to find true rest, not as a personality trait or a disorder. It is a condition, a human condition, that is the enemy of growth. We need to find rest. Well, what does rest look like? I'm using rest as a metaphor here. It's not only in terms of physical rest, although that is required a certain amount of it, but I'm talking about a much deeper rest, a much deeper rest that goes to the core of our being. Well, the hints for this come from attachment. And our understanding of attachment as attachment as being the preeminent need of all. The preeminent need of all. We used to think that survival needs were the most important and then came attachment needs. And then we realized uh, from evolutionary biology uh, th- that, uh, that children needed to be close, offspring needed to be close, the cub needed to be close uh, to, the, to the mother bear to increase the probability of being fed, being safe, being taken care of. And then we realized there aren't survival needs. Those are attachment needs. It is attachment which is necessary for survival. And so the brain is only concerned, the limbic system is only concerned about closeness. As far as the brain is concerned, if it can orchestrate closeness, then the rest will be taken care of. And so contact and closeness. So this is the most important thing to work for a child. The most important thing to work is contact and closeness with those attached to. There is no greater priority. Contact and closeness, proximity, and so on. And so, uh, and so this, is, this is what must work. And this is what a child begins to work at. To work at being the same as, significant, to being with, work at love, work at being important to, work at being esteemed, uh, work at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, to being seen and heard. And you see these children at work uh, in, in, their, in their texting, MSSing, in, their, in the social media. They're all working at closeness. And these children are not flourishing. They're working at closeness because the issue is not the closeness. The issue is the release. Is there release from this work? Is there release from this work? Just like hunger. The issue is not how much food a child has, but can they take it for granted? Is the provision greater than the pursuit? Do they know that they will be fed tomorrow? You could have a child in front in a banquet, a feast of food. And I've also all had parents say to me, but I have so much love for the child. I have so much love. Yes, but can the child take it for granted? 
Yes, but does a child, can the child re- relax, release him? But does a child know that he will be fed tomorrow? That he's not in charge of the contact and closeness? When children start working for this with their peers, uh, the provision is never greater than the pursuit. There's never a uh, relax. It is they work and work and work, and this is burning our children out. They are not flourishing. They are working at survival. Attachment is what needs to work for children, and therefore where rest is most required. A child can only find psychological rest when temporary, temporarily released from the pursuit and preservation of proximity. To be released, a child needs to feel safe to depend and to feel taken care of. Where are they going to get this? Again, okay. To be released... A child needs to feel safe to depend and to feel taken care of. For attachment needs to be met, the child must trust in the provision and sense that the provision is greater than the pursuit. Where is this going to happen? This won't happen at school. This won't happen in daycare. This isn't going to happen when your peers are more important to you than the adults in your life. This isn't going to happen there. Where is this going to happen? The deeper the attachment, the more likely to find release from the pursuit and preservation of proximity. Now let me show you, uh, when I put all the pieces together from all the attachment theories that I could put my fingers on some years ago now, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, 15, uh, 18 years ago, uh, the story of attachment looks something like this. Uh, it, uh, I'm going to use a plant analogy, and there's uh, multiple ways that a pl- uh, 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 multiple roots that a plant can can attach by, and the roots are how the plant attaches, so it can glean nurturance, so that it can hold on to the earth, uh, and so that uh, uh, that the uh, the plant can flourish. Uh, the first root. Uh, is where most attachment theories talk about. It's the attachment through the senses to be with, uh, to be in sight, in sound, in touch, in, in, uh, in smell. And that is always important. Uh, in our marriages, in our friendships, uh, in our attachments, we seek to be with. Uh, that is always important. That is foundational. When we no longer seeking to be with, then there's problems in the attachment. And so we automatically seek for this togetherness. But that's only the beginning. Nature has a a problem to solve. Uh, Humans are mobile creatures. We start toddling in our second year of life. Uh, How is the brain to be able to keep that toddler close when apart? This becomes an ultimate problem to solve. Nature has evolved a solution to this, but this takes time. By the second year of life, a whole new way of being close starts coming from the child, and the child interprets its closeness now as being like. When I am the same as, when I'm imitating, I, I have a grandson or two grandsons in that age, in the second year of life, one that's very attached to me, and he is preoccupied with being like me now, uh, finding my glasses, putting on them, walking like Papa walks, uh, literally putting on my shoes, making sounds like Papa does, and all of those things. Uh, this is huge. This is how language is acquired. Uh, this, 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 is, this, is, this is very, very significant. Uh, many people ask me, well, how you know children are attaching more to their peers than their parents well look at them they're walking like each other talking like each other dressing like each other Uh, that that is always an indication of attachment that sameness this is huge but by the third year of life when differences begin to show up says, well, how can the child hold on? What is the connection? And the connection is here and very important is belonging, to belong, to be part of a group, a group that is going to last. You can already see family is incredibly important here. And loyalty, to be able to take, to be on the same side, to, to, uh, uh, because closeness now is to be on the same side. Uh, to stand up for, to defend, to serve, to obey. Uh, These are the instincts that are here. Uh, 
Uh, While by the fourth year of life, which should unfold, and I have this in gray because it's more tentative, uh, attachment is always very, very vulnerable. You can easily get hurt when you want to be with somebody. You're injured by any sign that they do not want to be with you. If you want to be like somebody, you're injured by any indication of differentness. And so you always hurt, but when you go to a deeper level of attachment, this is even greater. A sense of mattering, when you want to matter to somebody, um, and closeness now is interpreted as mattering, as being dear to, uh, because there's the realization generally of the four-year-old that uh, mommy, daddy hold close that which they hold dear, is a child is preoccupied with, um, with being important to, dear to, significant to, and so on. Now, if everything is going well, we get to the fifth year, and the limbic system, the emotion part of the brain that's in charge of all of this, it pulls out all its stops and it goes, our vulnerability lies in our emotion. And so it, if everything seems safe, if everything seems okay, we're not facing separation, we can fall into attachment. And in that fifth year, there is the falling into it. The child starts in preparation, drawing in his artwork hearts. Hearts are a symbol of emotion in virtually every culture, every language, they're a symbol of emotion. The next thing that happens, if everything is okay, is a child will begin to give his heart to whomever he's attached to. If he's attached to grandma, he loves his grandma. He will draw hearts for his grandma. Give his grandma uh, cards. If he loves his papa, he will uh, do the same. Mommy on her birthday, daddy on... On a special day, I love you, and it comes from the heartfelt place. No, is this just cute? Isn't this just, you know, a kind of nice? No, it's absolutely pivotal, essential. As we go on, we'll find that it's absolutely necessary. A child must give his heart to whomever is responsible for raising him because it creates the context, it creates the ability to flourish, that, that there must be an emotional connection, and that there are so many studies uh, that, that are supporting uh, children must must have an emotional connection with those who are responsible for them, for this whole thing to work. And so there is the giving of hearts, and then, and then, if all goes well, a child will want to share all that is within his heart. He will not want to have secrets that divide. He will want to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, he will want to be seen and heard from the inside, the ultimate, in terms of attachment, to feel known, to be heard and seen. This is the womb of maturation. It takes time. It answers the basic problem of how to stay close when apart, the basic human problem, but it's a developmental solution. It creates a context in which we can shield the child's heart again in a wounding world. I'll speak a little bit more of that uh, later on. It, it develops the capacity for intimacy. So now we're prepare, prepared for friendship and marriage. But it turns out that this required a development. Children aren't automatically capable of intimacy. This is a potential that must be developed. Where is this potential going to be developed? We know it's not developed in daycare. We know it's not developed in school. Where is this potential? Where can a child be free to give his heart? And this is the key. This is the key. Family is best suited to do the work of attachment. Family is a natural context for caring and, and uh, depending. Now, I'll, uh, I'll add one more thing here in terms of caring and depending, uh, another aspect of attachment that can make sense, that caring is actually the work of attachment. In fact, caring is the primary emotion of attachment that is what attachment is for attachment is is there uh, to for one person to take care of another hopefully the more mature for the more immature but it doesn't always work that way uh, but that's the ideal uh, is that that would be there and so nature has to orchestrate this that's the purpose of attachment the first purpose is not for flourishing the first purpose is 
is to, is to orchestrate a context in which caring happens because caring needs to happen before flourishing can result. And so the purpose of attachment is to create a context where the young are cared for and taken care of. Now, when we realize that attachment is to facilitate caretaking, the automatic realization was, and when you see it, it's self-evident, but it takes you by surprise, that attachment does has to do this through two sets of instincts, alpha and dependent, uh, and two sets of drives, seeking and providing. In other words, attachment is hierarchical. It's not arranged like this, like we prefer to do things in Canada and Sweden, arrange everything like this. In equality, it is arranged hierarchically. Now, in democracies all over the world, we're so concerned about this that we forget that the developmental precursor of all of this is hi hierarchical relationships because that's where the fruit is created that allows us to have egalitarian relationships. You see, we think of the end product instead of thinking developmentally. It turns out that attachment is about taking care of each other. And because attachment does, uh, I try to illustrate it this way, we don't attach like this. We don't attach in this way. Uh, the brain can only attach through elevating the alpha instincts in one, uh, the instincts to be in charge, to take responsibility, to dominate, and so on, and the dependent instincts in the other. And that is the interface of attachment. And so there are two sets of instincts, uh, to look to the other for the answer, to get one's bearings, to orient, uh, to serve, uh, to, uh, to take directions, uh, to follow, all of this, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to belong to. Uh, this is the seeking. Uh, drive and the answer is the alpha, the providing, and each one is the answer to the other. So this creates the most ancient dance on earth. An attachment is a dance. It's a dance, and it's a dance when there. It's a dance of the of the of the seeker and the provider. It's a dance of the alpha and the dependent. It is that dance, and that is a dance of attachment. If you don't invite your grandchild to depend upon you, you don't even have a start in the relationship. Even in marriage, look at it this way. If you have two identical twins, and they attach to each other, nature has a problem. Same genetics, same family, but this is attachment. Attachment is about taking care of each other. So how is that going to happen? So nature is going to have to elevate the alpha instincts in one, the dependent instincts in the other, and that will be the dance. One of the identical twins will develop an alpha personality. The other identical twin will develop a dependent personality. Now, in an ideal situation, in a rare situation, they will take turns taking care of each other. One, one uh, a father just said to me recently, uh, he had uh, two identical twins, and he said, very, very interesting. He said they've been, they took turns every, every year, <laughs> is that it went up and down, and they took turns this way. Well, that's interesting. And you can see that this, to the degree that marriage is an attachment, that's what it is. We seek to be with, to belong, to be significant, uh, and, and seek some exclusiveness in it and all of those kinds of things. It is about taking care of each other. And that's what our vows are. I will take care of you through thick and thin. I will take care of you. So the best case scenario in marriage is where we take turns. But at any given moment... You have one moving to take care of each other. Uh, for uh, those of you in marriages where you are both alpha and you have difficulty taking turns, you'll know all the problems that result. You know, uh, there's only one steering wheel in today's cars. Uh, one of you is driving, but the other one thinks they're driving at the same time. You know, going for a lead in the walk. And we have all of these kinds of things. This is the biggest, this is the most difficult dance in marriage, the dance between equals uh, that is there. However, attachment doesn't dance that way. And this is the oldest dance, like any traditional dance, not the newfangled dances. Uh, since the twist came out in 1956, it's been different. Uh, but the old-fashioned dances, when you touch each other, there has to be a lead and a follow. 
You can take turns. You can even take turns within the particular dance. But there must be a lead and a follow. And this is the story of attachment. This is not politically correct. Okay? It's not politically correct to use the word dependence. It's not cr politically correct to use the word hierarchy. It's not politically correct to think of this in terms of a marriage. Unfortunately, developmental science is not politically correct. Uh, it is a pursuit of truth that doesn't consider politics. And so, but this, this, is, that this is what it is. Now, to divorce, and so caring, if I can go back to this, this is where caring comes from. This is where caring and receptiveness to caring comes uh, from the dependent. When the seeker attaches, they see the other as the answer. And that renders them receptive to this. There's all kinds of attachment prickles when that doesn't happen. Shyness and resistance to coercion, all kinds of things. It is when, you know, it's, it's when the pet, uh, and, and the way our, the animals become pets, is that they attach to us in a dependent mode. And if they attach to us in an alpha mode, like a horse or a dog, we can't take care of them. Uh, there is no way. And so this is the dance that must be there, uh, and the providing and... and and the seeking, uh, this is to be receptive to care and to care. And so our idea that we could divorce caring from family is not supported by anything we know in developmental science. There has to be a family-like attachment. That, that is, that is attachment. When adults, if, if, if one should care... Because one gets a paycheck at the end of the month, or it's their script, this is, this, this is not a caring that is the same caring that comes from attachment. This changes the whole definition of caring. Caring has to, a child must not know that a person is being, being paid to care. So we have a big secret to keep, don't we? Because it's not genuine. It's just like if you're paid for sex. No, no, that's supposed to be spontaneous, happen within a context of intimacy. We're never meant to divorce these things from the context of attachment. So our challenge is, when we are sharing the raising of children with other adults, our challenge is, is how to make those other attachments family-like. We need to extend this. The issue is, is how do we, how do we cultivate student teacher attachments? How do we cultivate child caregiver attachments so that they can be part of a child's family? Because a child is only receptive. It only feels like being cared for. And that's where genuine caring results. That's where we need to go to. It is, is not only in the sense of the preservation of family, but making more things like family because this is what we're doing. We need to extend our concept of family and have family like. Uh, this is the most effective. When a teacher comes like family like to a student, wow. Things happen academically and performance-wise and so on. And so this is it's spreading this way. So to, to divorce caring from attachment is unnatural. It's contrived. It removes, removes the essence of its effectiveness. The most effective caregivers attach to their charges and make it easy for their charges to attach to them, thus preserving the authenticity, the naturalness, and the spontaneity of caring. And for children to be cared for by adults who are following a script or caring for a reward is neither natural nor fruitful. It won't produce flourishing. And a flourishing is what we're after. Not just the status quo, not the norm, but of what we really want is, is our children to flourish. Then we have some work to do. Family is a natural place for children to look to for answers to their attachment needs, to be with, to be like, to belong, to be on the same side, to matter, to be loved, to be known. So family is best suited to do the work of attachment, the natural context for caring and depending, because of the permanence of the family role. And this is key. Family is a natural place for children to fall deeply into attachment. It is not safe to attach 
when separation is faced. We had this huge problem in society, many, many civilized countries, when we had children uh, that were without parents or who were not safe with their parents, and we had to apprehend those children and put them into other families. And when we first did this, uh, we gave instructions to those families not to get attached to those children and not to let those children attach to them uh, because it was just going to set them up for, for more pain. And oh my goodness, that was a problem because there was no context. No context. And so we decided that was wrong, and we decided, yes, children must attach, but now we had a problem. How is a child going to give you his heart when he thinks he's only got three months to live there? How is that going to happen? How does it happen when he's facing separation automatically? So that's the question. How does, it, how is it, how does that happen? And so this is the big issue. How do you cultivate student-teacher attachments? How can you convince teachers that they may have to say to a child, you'll always have a special place. You will always have a special place in my heart. And you move the attachment from something that's temporary to something that is permanent so it becomes family like. And that's the place where the, where the child then feels free. There is something that is more permanent to be able to give his heart away. And family is the most likely place for the provision to be greater than the pursuit and, and uh, for the relationship to, to uh, resolve the problems. Um, and so this is, I put it this way, is that, uh, that family attachments are most suitable for this to happen. Again, I'm not saying that families always work. But it is absolutely clear that in many cases, in most cases, only families could work. And so families are the most suited for this and need our support when they're not working, not to take away from family, uh, but, to, uh, but to create more family-like uh, relationships. That that is the answer to this. It's the only place where there's release from this because it must be, the provision must be greater than the pursuit. There must be a greater sense of love, of contact and closeness. Uh, there must be greater sense of significance than the pursuit. Otherwise, there is no release. And so if you can see this here, this, this bubble here, uh, so I add to this in this diagram, pardon the mixed metaphors. I, it's, uh, you know, we've got a plant and then we've got play and then we've got a bubble and, and so on. But uh, you, you get the picture. Uh, you get the picture. So we've got uh, that this supports uh, the, the uh, place of play, which allows uh, the child to emerge as a viable separate being, uh, play with conflicting information, uh, the integrative process, uh, uh, face, uh, face losses and separations, uh, you know, hide and seek, uh, uh, playing uh, with, uh, with facing death, all of these things that children must play with before they can ever handle in real life. And so it, it, it provides it uh, uh, the consequence. There's another kind of rest. And that rest, a child must find rest from doing things that do not work, uh, from, uh, from uh, futile endeavors, uh, from, from behavior that cannot work, will not work, uh, shouldn't work. Uh, there needs to be rest from trying to make things work that won't work, can't work, shouldn't work, from railing against reality, uh, from railing against restrictions and limitations, from getting one's way when that is not possible, from avoiding separation, lack, or loss. How is this going to happen? Uh, this adaptation, again, is spontaneous but not inevitable. So what needs to happen? It turns out that futility needs to be felt. A child needs to feel the futility of changing mother's mind, of changing uh, that daddy is, is, uh, is, is leaving on a trip, uh, that mommy is going to work, that, uh, that there's only one story tonight, that it's time to go to bed, uh, that I can't uh, uh, continue playing, all of these kinds of things. The futility must be felt. Well, when it's felt, something amazing happens. When futility is felt in the amygdala, in the limbic system, the amygdala is a command center, the gear shift in the, in the system. When it is felt, the gear shift changes gears 
stops the child from doing what they're doing, changes the sympathetic nervous system, which is the the system to make things work, to the parasympathetic to rest. The energy goes down to the center where the parasympathetic is, always to the digestive, to the restorative things where the parasympathetic is is, uh, on this. And it sends signals to the lacrimal glands and the eyes water. Amazing. Amazing. And so these tears, these special tears of futility, have become the symbol, the icon of human transformation through the centuries, through the millennia. Uh, The Greeks had words for the big futilities of life. They called them tragedies. And the symbol of coming to terms with a tragedy is a tear. And they had a maxim. uh, They had a saying that unless you come to terms with with the futilities in your life, uh, you will never be able to proceed, to adapt, to grow. It was absolutely essential. And so they create these plays to make, especially us males, uh, still today, you know, we have to go to movies to find our tears about things that uh, do not work. You know, they're, they're pretty hard to find. Uh, but we, we do this. But this is, is, is what it was. Now, when we get to five, six, seven years of age, most of us learn to keep our tears on the inside. Uh, first of all, these tears, a few Utility are different than tears cry to onions. They're different than cr- tears cry to upset, uh, frustration. There's many kinds of tears to pain. These tears cry to futility actually have a different chemical composition because there's a transformation from sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system. So you can actually, in a lab, there's a lab in, in Minneapolis in the United States that studies these tears of human adaptation. But this is what is necessary. Keep this in mind because now start thinking, where does a family play in this? Uh, Again, when futility is felt, the limbic system sends signals to the lacrimal glands and the eyes tend to water. This is the outward manifestation. We can keep our tears on the inside as we grow older, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is futility. The experiences of felt futility drive human adaptation. This is the process by which we become changed by that which we cannot change. So we have to rest Find rest. It's not a peaceful rest. But we have to find rest. When we're up against the things we cannot change, loss, death, rejection, not getting my way all the time, not all of these things. They, a child has to find this to flourish. Uh, the the uh, illustration we use is the maze. Uh, we walk the maze blind. It's not what works that is stamped in. We know we got it wrong. We, know, we used to think the brain was built uh, by stamping in what works. We got it wrong. The brain has, has millions and millions of possibilities for connections. The way the brain is built is through pruning out what doesn't work. And that is a journey of feeling sad and disappointed about what isn't there. Uh, this, this understanding uh, is having a hard time entering our human consciousness. Uh, so family is best suited to do the work of adaptation. Why? Why is family best suited? Uh, family is a natural context for conveying futility. No, I can't let you do this now. Uh, no, your, your, uh, uh, your sister said she wasn't willing to share her toys. You're going to have to live with this. It's time to go to bed. And all the hundreds of futilities you can think of in the day of a child are usually, and are usually given in the context of the family. So family is the agent of futility. Uh, and, and a child will also only accept a message of futility if attached in a dependent mode. Uh, So a child isn't going to accept uh, that uh, the no as a no, and I can't do this, and I, you know, that I can't be best all the time and first all the time, unless they are attached, giving authority uh, to uh, to the parent, to the grandparent, to the father, to the mother. And family is a natural context for giving and receiving comfort. We were never meant to cry in public. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in our society. Uh, Our society is tear-phobic. But it it isn't even natural. I'll give you an example. 
I, I'm, I, uh, I've been a therapist for a long time. You could say my occupation is to make people cry. Because I can't heal people. And it's only through the process of adaptation where they recover, where they find resilience. My job as a therapist was to hold individuals, uh, figuratively speaking, in a space until they felt safe enough to find their own tears. Now, uh, my first grandson, Julian, uh, he, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, three years of age, uh, full of frustration. There were things that were not working. And I knew he was up against things he could not change. And he needed to be uh, kind of uh, uh, helped to the space where he could find his tears about them. And so, uh, this is fine. I, I did my job as a family member, as Papa, saying no when I needed to do. I can't let you do this. This is Papa's job. That's not to touch, and this is all now, and we're putting this away. Now, you'd think, because I was an expert at being able uh, to draw tears out of people, uh, that I should be able to do this with my own grandson. In fact, I couldn't. You would tighten up. You would just everything, you know, I, most I would get a quiver out of his mouth. You know, it was just in this. And then his mother would come on the scene. And my daughter, he would run to her, burst into tears. Grandpa is so mean. He is so this. But he would burst into tears. Why? Because he was much more attached to his mother than he was to me. We feel most safe to find our tears, our sadness, our grieving in the arms of those we are most attached to. That is the way of attachment. And that is family work. That doesn't mean that a therapist can't do it, but a therapist becomes family-like to the client. Do you follow me? Family-like. And that's the point. It doesn't mean that you can't do this, but the family. A child will typically only receive comfort if attached in a dependent mode. So this little transformation where mad must move to sad, feelings of alarm must move to sad, feelings of intensified pursuit, this little transformation that must happen in the limbic system is family work. Is family work. It's not likely to exist in any other setting in society. And when a child does find his tears, he, it, it often is shamed. It's not the place. It draws attention to him. It, it, gets, uh, it gets put down. Uh, this is family work. That means that this is huge. This is a huge human potential. We're wondering why. We're having so many, dis so many diagnoses now of children who are not adapting to the circumstances in their life. Non-adaptation is part of the ten most common syndromes children are, are diagnosed with. And some call these the tearless syndromes. Because adaptation isn't taking place. It doesn't mean uh, that it's caused somebody to be blind to the lack of tears. It's when they don't find their tears about all the futilities that come with blindness that their brain can't find a workaround. We call it neuroplasticity in developmental science. And the outward manifestation of neuroplasticity is, is, the, is the ability to move from mad to sad, and that is family work. And if we need to support families in this because if we don't, we're going to lose our potential to adapt as human beings. And that is key to flourishing. We all need a safe place to cry. We all need a safe place to cry. And so the fruit of adaptation, resilience, resourcefulness, recovers from trauma, benefits from adversity, learns from consequences. This is family work. If the family is doing its work, the school can do its job. But the school is not there to foster adaptation. The school is there to give correction. But how is a child to learn from correction? You see, that, that is family growing. So we go to one more. We go to another level here. Well, what undergirds rest? What supports rest? How can a child find rest? Why are we having so many diagnoses now with restlessness in it? Uh, that, uh, that children are agitated, they don't find rest. What is required for rest? And we find 
the requirement to find rest, whether it's from things working or from things not working, whether it's from love, the satiation of attachment needs momentarily, or from futility, uh, from having our tears about something that does not work. What is required is these are issues of emotion, and one must feel one's tender emotions. Now, emotion is a huge thing. It's like a huge iceberg. There's many levels, the chemical levels, electrical levels. There's impulse levels. There's instinct levels. There's many levels. But the tip of the iceberg uh, that is a possibility, uh, not necessarily an inevitability, is a feeling. And we we can feel our emotion. And it turns out uh, that, that the limbic system can do its best work when we actually feel our emotion, it turns out that humans are the only, only uh, creatures who can feel their emotions. And feel their emotions we must if we're going to become fully human and fully humane. And so, uh, to use intuitive language here, our children need to have soft hearts. Soft hearts to be able to feel their tender emotion. Now we look around... And there's all kinds of indications of all kinds that our children are losing their feelings. They're losing their feelings. They're losing feelings of caring, losing feelings of of um, uh, of alarm. No longer saying I'm uh, the number of four-year-olds who no longer say I'm scared, I'm afraid, I'm nervous. Uh, losing feelings of embarrassment, losing feelings of, of shame, losing feelings of curiosity. We need to feel all our emotions. It turns out that our limbic system, the emotions, were not a nuisance variable at all. They had work to do. Uh, all of neuroscience is discovering emotion as the core, the engine. It, it made, they were, there was a reason. The brain has emotion, yes, is irrational, but the brain has its reasons. And these are the reasons. Emotion was the first motivational system, intention the second, but unlike our, our baby teeth, they don't fall out. And so we have motions for life. And emotions are, are absolutely what is meant to move us. E, in Latin to motion move, is what was meant to move us. The problem is, is that when we lose our tender emotion, uh, the brain cannot move us to rest, cannot move our children to rest. Uh, from satiation, from love, uh, or from, uh, from uh, to feelings of futility. So soft hearts become essential for this, absolutely essential for rest to happen and for play to happen. Who would have known that we needed to feel? For so long, emotions have been considered a nuisance variable. They've been considered a vestigial part from our animal nature, uh, that we can be too emotional. Emotions are just, are, are just for children, and, uh, and women were discounted for centuries because they were too Emotional. Yes. Emotion was the enemy. Ration, reason was the answer. And now we find, no, emotion is core. Our children need to feel their tender emotions. What keeps children from feeling their emotions? The primary reason is the need to function in a wounding environment where feelings get hurt. You see, our vulnerability, in English it means capable of being wounded, vulnerable. Our vulnerability lies in our feelings. And so the, and, and so the more we feel, the more we are capable of getting hurt. The more we get hurt, the more it interferes with our vital functioning, our ability to perform in a wounding environment. So in Canada, uh, we sent, and I believe in Sweden, our soldiers to Afghanistan uh, to be able to work there. And they're in, equipped for a wounding environment. And what does the brain do? Uh, the brain backs off all their tender feelings because oh, it's just too much. It's unbearable to work in a wounding environment where you don't know if you'll be alive the next day, what it's going to be, and so on. And then they come home, 
And they need their tender feedings to function. And so there's problems in their family, problems in mental health, problems in emotional health, and all of these things. Uh, but this has been around with children for, for eons. We're just discovering this in terms of adults. This is huge. The brain is capable of numbing out tender feelings via emotional filters in the limbic system in order to preserve the ability to function and to perform in stressful and wounding environments. If we look at it this way, the heart is easily wounded, our feelings are easily wounded, the brain does not stand idly by, it brings filters in uh, to be able to reduce it. Now, these are meant to be situational. When a child is, it goes to school, gets his feelings hurt at recess, or goes to daycare, or whatever it is, and we now know that the number one source of wounding in today's society is peer interaction. So when we send our children into the peer situation, we are sending them into wounding environments. That, that is absolutely clear in terms of our, our research. And so the wounding environment. Now, that they function better, and this is the point. They function better when they're defended. They can concentrate better when they're defended. They can eat their lunch when they're defended. They can do all of these, these kinds of things, uh, but it is at the cost of their feelings. But since we don't look at feelings, we don't realize the cost. We're looking at behavior. We're looking at performance. We're looking at suffering, and we don't look at behavior. Now, uh, I myself, when I'm here presenting to you like this, I don't... Uh, I, I'm very shy by nature. I, uh, when I first started presenting, when I first taught uh, courses at university, uh, I, 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 my, uh, as a professor, I would, have, uh, I, I would feel terribly exposed, uh, uh, as if I was terribly vulnerable. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm intense, as a therapist is intense. And uh, I, I'm a theorist. It's not natural for me uh, to do this kind of thing. And so my brain would say, well, I had to go to work, and so it would numb me out a little bit, and, which was very good. Uh, if I was tired, I didn't feel my tiredness. If I was hungry, I didn't feel my hunger. Uh, if I was sick, I didn't feel my sickness. I was, I was equipped to perform in a wounding environment. Well, that's good. And when I got home in the end of the day to my loved ones, to my family, uh, my defenses could drop, and all my feelings came back. In fact, even now when I am away on a trip and away from my wife, all I do is call home and I start yawning. I, right away, my brain says, okay, now we can relax and now we can eat. Now I can, you know, I feel my aches, all of those kinds of things. And this is exactly what it's for. But how many children, there's no end of the day. For how many children, there's no end of the week. There's no letting down. This ideal, and I'm not saying families always work, but it was meant to be when you came home from a wounding environment where you need to be wounded. A three-year-old needs to, uh, to be shielded, to function. Otherwise, they're going to get their feelings hurt, to come back, and all their feelings come back. There's no problem with, with, with being wounded for just or being shielded for a few hours, for a day. It's when it gets stuck, and we're finding that in many kids this is getting stuck and there's a whole all these vulnerable feelings are going missing uh, that, uh, uh, for instance, the feelings of fulfillment, uh, the, the, there can be uh, the family can be full of love all kinds of love that is there uh, but of course, uh, feelings of emptiness are, are very wounding, uh, of missing, of loneliness, of insecurity and it turns out that if you can't say I miss if you don't feel your emptiness, you'll lose the capacity to ever feel full. you lose the capacity for fulfillment. And so now the brain is stuck. It can't move you. Uh, feelings of futility get lost. Sadness, disappointment, grief, and sorrow. I worked uh, for years with children who had lost their tears. They were non-adaptive. Uh, they had, were full of learning disabilities. Their brain could not find any workarounds for the problems they had. Uh, feelings of caring, of course, empathy, compassion, compassion, devotion, and concern. The research shows, very interestingly, that when children lose their blush, embarrassment, when they no longer feel exposed, they lose their caring. How in the world could this be explained? How can embarrassment be linked to empathy? Very simply. When you become defended against one, you automatically become defended against the other. 
What these are, the, what, what it, this is in, in uh, the same as the woundedness. And so children lose their feelings of alarm. Now, the point is, is these feeling, these children look better. The teacher, the daycare provider, even the psychologist often will say, hmm, okay, these children look better. They perform better in wounding environments. They concentrate better. Uh, Their vital functioning is preserved in these wounding environments. But if we look closely, we find there is a loss of empathy, just as it is. And if we look over the generations, we find uh, that the adolescents of today are less empathic than the adolescents of a generation ago. They were less empathic than the adolescents of a generation before. Our research is showing that something is happening in our society. Our children are losing their feelings. That, that, is where, that is what we need to be concerned about. You get loss of empathy, you get more wounding, and so on. And then we start having these kinds of things are increasing all over civilized countries. Uh, arrest, developmental arrest, alarm problems, anxiety, agitation, adrenaline seeking, aggression problems, suicide problems, addiction and bullying, all a result of the flight from vulnerability. Uh, Children, uh, I I believe, are experiencing more separation, and that's the most wounding thing. Of course, more peer interaction, and that is wounding. Uh, My book is about peer orientation, how when children, uh, when peers matter more uh, to uh, each other, uh, when they're equal and age matters more uh, than their uh, uh, parents and teachers and grandparents, it sets them up for getting wounded more. And that's a vulnerability that is too much to bear. And of course, now we have the digital playground. And that is a wounding environment. We have the digital playground. Then we take our children uh, to the physicians, and physicians have always had the mandate to reduce suffering and increase performance. And so they look at the child. They're not trained in developmental processes. They don't think, okay, how will this children flourish? The question is, is how can I get this child to perform in school, right? That's the question. Well, that's easy. We've got all kinds of medications that help numb the feelings. And so we medicate to aid and abet the flight from vulnerability. Everybody is satisfied. This child no longer talks about hurt feelings, no longer talks about missing mommy and daddy, no longer talks about this. All of the signs show is able to perform in a, in, in a wounding environment, and nobody is asking at what cost. At what cost? The cost of flourishing of realizing our potential as human beings. Our children are losing their feelings. Uh, the problem is this is all a result of defendedness. Uh, th- this, it's, this, it works, but for the wrong reasons. For the wrong reasons. So what is the answer to keeping children safe in a wounding world? We can't turn back time. We're in a situation now. What is the answer to keeping children safe in a wounding world? Our children are in this world, are in the digital world. And the research is unequivocal in this. All kinds of research, longitudinal research, one with 90,000 adolescents, is the single most important factor that keeps a child safe in a wounding world is a strong emotional connection with a caring adult. That is a single thing. Why? Because when grandma, when auntie, when, a, when you've given your heart to a teacher matters more to you than anybody else, what everybody else thinks matters less. And the brain does not have to the defend then uh, against this. The shield is that of attachment. But here is the caveat. Here is it. The child must give his heart... Before we can keep it safe. If a child has not become emotionally connected, if a child is not given his heart, we are unable to keep it safe in the wounding world. And there again comes in family. Family is best suited to shield a child from a wounding world. We must have a child's heart before we can protect it. Family is the most likely context for deep emotional connection as a heart will not typically be given when the child faces separation. So there must be the sense of forever. And that is family. 
Family is forever. Or the child has to work for approval. The permanence of the family role is best suited to provide the safety that is needed. Uh, peer interaction, as I said, is the primary source of wounding for today's children, children who are not shielded by a deep attachment to a member of the family are most at risk. And again, family, family is our answer here. It is family. Attachments, not all families work, but families are best suited to work. And if they're best suited to work, then that's our best investment. It is the family attachments which can shield the child. The brain can do two things wonderfully. The brain uh, can grow the child up to be flourishing, uh, to realize the full potential. And the brain can armor the child against the vulnerability too much to bear. It can do both things, but it can only do one at a time. And so if the brain needs to armor the child... So much for flourishing. And there's another answer to shielding the child, and that's family. But we need to have the child's heart. So the answer to soft hearts, we, we, we found this pyramid then. The foundation of this pyramid is family relationships. Is family relationships. Uh, this becomes our best hope, family relationships. I will add this. this uh, we will add one more uh, mixed metaphor here, if you can bear it. Uh, so we're going to add a heart to the plant, uh, to the bubble, uh, to the brackets. Uh, so uh, take it with a grain of salt, but I couldn't figure out how to be able to stay within one metaphor. So uh, this is your ultimate of mixed metaphors. Uh, but this is family work. Heart is family work. Play, uh, providing the conditions for play, it is family work. Uh, uh, providing more than is pursued, uh, this is family work. Uh, so family is best suited to support true play, uh, to be a buffer to societal agendas and expectations, to care for their children, to be a place of rest, to do the work of attachment, to support the adaptive process, uh, to be a home for the heart, to function as a womb for maturation, to shield from a wounding heart, and to cultivate deep, caring attachments. Now, you could take school away, and if family replaced that, a child would not be jeopardized. Uh, you could take many things away in our society and institutions away. Uh, they have only been here for a short time. Family has been here for a long time. We have been in families. Families are the key, the natural place for this. Now, I'm going to add two more. I just have a few minutes, and I'm going to add two more things, because these are the things that are often are saying, yes, but family has its limitations uh, in terms of things that only school can provide. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to take a look at two more things. Family is also best suited to prepare the child for the outside world. Family is best suited to learn outside of context of attachment. We know that children are designed to learn within attachment. Children learn more words in the first four years of life than all their formal, from, the, from their family than all their formal education put together for the rest of their life. It's amazing. We look at that. All natural in terms of attachment. And so to learn outside a context of attachment. The question is, what does a child need to bring to school for learning to result? What needs to be in their backpack, right? What do they need to come to school with? Uh, I call this the teachability factor. What renders children schoolable? What renders children teachable? Well, it's fairly easy. Curiosity, a sense of agency, ability to learn from mistakes, and ability to process dissonance. These are absolutely required. All our contemporary curriculum is based predicated upon these being present. We assume that children have questions about their universe. We assume they can learn from correction. We assume they can process conflicting information. All our curriculum is based upon that. That's the assumption. However, where does this come from? We know that in, in the, uh, you know, that if we have six children, uh, five-year-olds who are still curious about their world, uh, we're doing, uh, you know, in a whole class, we're doing well. If you have one or two students in the upper grades, in grade 11 and grade 12, who are curious about the world, we're doing well. Where does this come from? And we're killing it in our society. Where does this come from? 
um, you know, or they need to have attachment to their teacher because that is where it would come from. This used to come from home. I'm going to suggest to you in traditional cultures, one of the jobs of the family is to make sure the child is attached to the teacher so the teacher can do their job. Nice arrangement. And I'm going to suggest that's one of the functions of family we've forgotten. And we need to get back to being able to figure out how to do this. But when we look at these things over here, we find that they're the fruit of maturation. They're the fruit of a flourishing child full of interest and curiosity over here, uh, learns from dissonance over here, benefits from correction. This is home growing. And so child is able to teach the school, teach the child uh, that is flourishing as a result of the conditions the family has provided. Another, how do we produce uh, individuals full of empathy? This is a huge question. Well, when we put the pieces of empathy together, empathy is a fruit. It's a fruit. And the main support is caring, which is a function of attachment, consideration, which is part of the fruit of the integrative process. What is supposed to happen by a child becoming six or seven? Absolutely spontaneously. So where does this come in? Both require a soft heart. And the roots of it, the roots are very clear in deep emotional attachments with, with uh, adults and, and uh, appropriate alpha instincts when they take care of those underneath them that are depending upon them, younger siblings, uh, younger children. It is in the hierarchy of care where it comes out. That is the roots of empathy. This, again, is family work. And then finally, to cultivate egalitarian values, that is always a question. But isn't this, how, you know, is this? Well, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1763, when he conceived of the French-style construct of democracy, it became so clear to him that children need to become separate beings, separate individuals, before they spontaneously treat others as separate individuals. It was so clear to him that this was homegrown. You cannot teach the spirit of democracy from the outside. It is homegrown. That's why we can't export democracy anywhere. It has to, it has to be homegrown. Where does it come from? It comes from a, the, the result of flourishing conditions to flourish, where as a result of these processes, children spontaneously become considerate and civilized and develop egalitarian values. Now, these are homegrown, the fruit of family attachments. When family becomes eroded in culture, uh, we lose the, the, uh, the places from which the children come that are schoolable, that are teachable, and that become integrated in our society. And so again, uh, the final, uh, to bring to conclusion here, uh, family are best suited uh, to provide the conditions required for children to flourish, uh, to uh, th family relationships are the foundation, are, are the, uh, the institution uh, that is, uh, is uh, meant to, is best suited uh, for, uh, to, uh, to produce uh, well-being in children, uh, to realize the full potential. And to the degree that our children will, our society will reflect that. Back, the final slide then, back to the United Nations on the family, their declaration. There is no doubt that this is so, and the conclusion is, is absolutely we, we should be supporting this. But I hope that now I have helped you understand why. And I hope that that makes a difference. Because if we can understand why, that is what will move us to make a difference. That it is so is unarguable. Why it is so is an insight that we now require to be able to uh, make a difference in our world today. Thank you for the invitation to address this subject. I hope together we can celebrate family. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much.